it was really crazy when I started campaigning on this about 10 years ago. People th were like, Tarzan's and Jane? Like the movie? Like, what do you mean Tarzan? And I was like, we're screwed. But now people know, which is good. There's been a whole, whole bunch of us trying to work really hard and expose the issue um, of the biz the, um because back in the day when I was growing up, we just called it the rigs. That's what everyone called it. And everyone went to work up in the rigs and you know, no one really knew what that was. And there wasn't this discussion about um, switching from conventional oil, because we've had conventional oil for 70 to 80 years in Alberta, but um, switching to this unconventional, which you can see here, which is heavy, viscous, very dense, like peanut butter. It's not free flowing, it's unconventional. So it's the extreme, like fracking. Um, kind of breaking apart Mother Earth. So that's, they have to dig down um, 100 meters, that's where they get the tar sands, or they have to s the superheat the steam, like I was talking about earlier. So this is the area and where we're from. Um, as I said, this is my kukum and my dad up in the bush. Um, we make a lot of hides and moose meat, and my grew up on moose meat. My dad's a hunter. Um, and this is the development that I showed you yesterday, so I won't go into it. Um, but I just wanted to bring this in because the reason why um, we, we work with a lot of communities along the different pipeline routes. So we're at the ground zero, but then tar sands is all over Turtle Island. So it's going into the coast here, the coast there. All of these are refineries, um, these little dots here. And so that means cancer clusters for a lot of the communities in around that area. The north is the natural gas pipelines and then the tankers on the coast. So we've been doing a lot of protesting against the Keystone XL and the Gateway Pipeline and the Kinder Morgan Pipeline and now the Energy East Pipeline. There's a lot of pipelines that go across. In Alberta, we have 400,000 kilometers of pipelines. It's a lot. Um, so we've been protesting a lot of pipelines throughout the years to try to stop, stop it um, to coming from the source. So one of the things that I wanted to talk about was more about um, the idea of cultural and environmental genocide and neocolonialism and talking about how this is a, camp, a culture camp that we had actually in the heart of one of the tar sands impacted regions and you can see um, cutting, um, drinking dry meat with my family and there's in the Athabasca region they're drying fish and so this is what our territories look like you know when it's in its quasi healthy state and this is what it's being replaced by. And so, you know, this is on our territory. That was the pipeline that was built um, flaring on our territory. And then this is the, in the Athabasca region where they actually have the, the surface mines, which are actually as big as entire cities. So these city, um, Imperial Oil uh, will, when it's all said and done, this is the, the latest mine that's being built. Um, it will be about 200 square kilometers or 180 square kilometers between that. And that's actually as big as Washington, DC. So that's just one mine. So it's really huge areas. Um, yeah, and so I think one of the truths with going into what we're talking about this morning is I think a lot of times people think that colonization has ended and you know it hasn't, we know that. And it's neo-colonialism, I think a lot of us call that. Um, and I think one of the forms is resource extraction. And so that's kind of what I've been surrounded by growing up and it was pretty normalized for a long time and then um, my memories with my Kukumamus and my grandmother and grandfather um, and my family, we, because they were traditional and they, they didn't go to residential schools, they, they, grew, they, were, they lived off the land. Um, they didn't speak English and so they, they, they had their like seasonal cycles and so even into their old age, um, they would go on horse and wagon and so I, as, a, as one of their grandchildren, I'd go on the horse and wagon with them. And it was a really beautiful ex um, experiences because I remember from a very young age how pristine the land was, and this was just in the 80s. And um, as more and more, when I left for school and then I would come back and coming into the 90s and into the early 2000s, you know, I would literally be crying of like how much it's changed just within my lifetime. And um, it's, it's really sad to see, um, kind of like here, it's, it's really dry now and it used to be really moist and there's a lot of forest fires, but then there's also, because of the oil and gas industry sucking out a lot of the water, the subsurface water, it's, it's super dry even from underneath and from within. Um, yeah, so definition of neocolonialism is the continual encroachment on our territories um, and also involves state-funded governments, businesses and organizations to control our peoples and our communities, um, a lack of recognition of our leadership and governance systems, and also a lack of support by settler communities to work that work hand in hand with the government or with the corporations, which happens a lot in Alberta. Um, 
One of the things that I think is really helpful for people to understand just how much the land has changed in northern Alberta. I like this quote. It says, since operations began, tar sands extractors have moved more than 1.4 billion tons of what industry calls overburden, which is actually the boreal forest. So that was more dirt than was moved for the Great Wall of China, the Suez Canal, the Great Pyramid of Cheops, and the 10 largest dams in the world combined. So this is how much dirt they're moving every day because they have to get out. Um, they just they basically have dump trucks and they for about one to two tons of just dirt, then they get one oil of bitumen or tar sands. And so it's really it's it's ex, 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 extreme and immense. And the tailing ponds too. Like we flew over this. This is you know from the air, um, and you can see that they're like basically just withdrawing water and then they're contaminating it. And that's. Really, you know, the water quality impacts are very misunderstood, and every day these tailing ponds are leaching toxic contaminants. They're not, they're not lined, so they're basically just dig holes and then just like flush um, into their designated areas, and they're just contaminated. And so this is like cyanide, mercury, lead, polyamide, hydrocarbons, nephetic acids, it's toxic sludge, um, very cancer-causing carcinogens. This is something that I think is really helpful for people to understand. So this is a satellite image. So this is taken from space. So you can actually see the tailing ponds. Those, those, um, they look like water, but it's just toxic sludge from space. You can see that. This is the highway they call the Highway of Death, going up to Fort McMurray because it's such a dangerous highway to drive on because of all the heavy, heavy equipment that goes up and down and the crazy drivers that are hopped up on a lot of cocaine. Um, to stay awake in their shifts, but um, so the, this is actually, this is the before and after of how the land is completely fragmented and how, why we're seeing um, disappearances of animals to the, and extirpation from the area. So this is all the different kind of lines that connect, so you can see how much it fragments and that's why researchers have said by 2040, the woodland caribou um, will be locally extinct or extirpated from our, from our territories. We tell, also just took this picture, they just leave dead trees. I was standing on top of that. Actually, that was where that picture was taken in there. Um, we just found a, um, dead trees and the explosions right beside communities. So this is close to Fort Mackay First Nation. And this is an explosion. It doesn't look like much from the air, but it's actually a 300 meter crater from one of the in situ plants because of the casing, the superheated steam just like exploded. And so you can see they call it a catastrophic explosion. This is a French company, Total. So you can see all the earth has melted because they have to superheat that steam to 240 to 350 degrees Celsius. So it's really hot. Um, then also pipeline explosions, natural gas pipeline, hydrogen sulfide pollution, um, which is really hard on the lungs, nitrogen oxides. Um, and then we're using one natural gas to make another natural gas. So we're using, you know, I mean, one fossil fuel to make another fossil fuel. So we're using natural gas like fracking or, you know, so, sweet light or um, sour gas to from our territories to make tar sands. So it's really crazy. Um, and then you can see the, what the difference between how the, the return, so like conventional oil, you make one barrel of oil, you get 100, like the amount of energy you use, you get 100 barrels. For tar sands, you get three barrels. It's just, it's just crazy how, that's why it's so expensive. So this is actually larger now, but the emissions growth in Canada is actually at 70 megatons. I have to update that. Um, because of the tar sands. So tar sands is the fastest growing source of greenhouse gas emissions in Canada and that's why um, it's impossible for Canada to meet its international um, climate obligations and um, even though with the new Trudeau government says that they can but they can't make a 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius. Um, and I think the reason why this is so irresponsible in the face of climate change is because every year you know th th hundreds of thousands of people die from climate change and Millions of more are made climate refugees, and yet we're still, you know, producing this like nobody's business. Um, yeah, you can see we actually produce in the tar sands more greenhouse gas emissions than New Zealand was producing as a country. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, nuclear, also, but luckily it hasn't happened. This is a really this is the before and after of why we can't practice, you know, practice our culture in um, in certain areas because this is the aftermath. You know, this is what they call reclamation, the before and after, right? So they don't have to replace any of the species. So uh, they, I think they made an agreement at one point was if they destroy 10 species, they only have to put three back. Like, how is that an ecosystem, right? I don't want to pick berries from there. I mean, you couldn't even pick berries from there.
and they call that equivalent land use capacity. This is the industry terms. Um, so most tar sands operations haven't been certified even though they've been going for 40 years. Um, one square kilometer has been certified, so that's the woodland caribou, the lynx. Um, the migratory songbirds, so actually these, um, a lot of the migration paths are through the tar sands unfortunately, and so it comes from, they, the songbirds come from South America and also like the whooping crane, a lot of birds come up north in the summertime and then they go back down. But because they're, they're basically landing on these tailing ponds and they're, they're, a lot of the birds are perishing, um, but you don't really hear much about that. And then this is the oil spill that we had back home. So this is, um, this is a person. So we took this from the air too. It was really hard to get a helicopter because it had a lot of people hang up on me because they, they didn't want to fly us. So that was really upsetting. Um, and yeah, so we finally got a helicopter that wasn't, didn't do industry oil and gas um, contracts. They did logging contracts instead, so they flew us. Um, so that's actually a beaver dam. So basically it consumed a bunch of beaver, beaver dams. It's, it broke from over there and then it consumed this whole, what we call, this is April 29th. So usually this is really green and greener in the summer because it's muskeg. Um, it's, it's a water, it's like a very water um, based area um, and a lot of our medicines grow along um, like like uh, rat root and a lot of immune boosting medicines that we use traditionally and make a lot of teas out of um, Laboom like our mint this is what it looks like up close so a lot of my family was actually cleaning this um, area you can see right there all the oil in there and then what my, you know, I was calling around to different health practitioners to be like, what is my family being exposed to? Um, isobutenes and hexenes because a lot of what they were saying, like my auntie who was going to come here, and unfortunately she's not here, but she was the one that actually alerted me to the oil spill because I wasn't home at the time. And she, she t she's taught Korean in the community for 30 years in the school. And um, she was like, she texted me and she's like, we can't breathe, our eyes are burning, we're, we have headaches, we're feel like throwing up, like we're feeling nauseous, um, we don't know what's happening. We went out and we, we took the kids out from the school and we brought them out to the field and, and, to, and we thought it was a propane leak inside of the school, but we went out to the field and it was worse. So she's like, can you find out what it, what's going on because no one's telling us what's happening. And because of the work that she knows that I do, I started going, I was going online and like looking around anywhere um, and the only thing that I found at that point in time was a business website that said that this pipeline had been shut down because there was a spill. And there was only a couple hundred barrels. It actually ended up being 4.5 million liters or 28,000 barrels. So and that was just like as the crow flies, probably about five, seven miles away maybe at the most from where my family was. So all of the toxic fumes were wafting into the community. And yet the government and the company were like, everything's fine. Just stay, no one has to evacuate. They didn't even say anything to evacuate, whereas when I was talking to certain doctors um, that people that actually advocate for people's health, they're like, no, pregnant women should not be there. Small children should not be there. Elders that have compromised health systems should not be there, and yet, nothing. It was the only reason why um, it was exposed is because five days later after the government was uh, elected in the Harper government, so kind of like the Bush era in Canada was Harper, um, he, they finally released that there was a spill. So they didn't actually release it until after the election, five days later, to the community to inform them. So, so my family and all the community was sitting inside the little school waiting for the government officials to come in and they didn't show up. And they just sent a one-page fact sheet to the school and they were like, oh, FYI, you're beside the biggest oil spill in Alberta's history. And that's how they informed my family. Yeah. So it was, and so when we got that fact sheet, I just, we blasted it out to all the media and we're like, biggest oil spill. Um, and then luckily we had a lot of media come because it was five hour drive away from the city. So it's, it's you know, it's like 10 hour drive there and back. And, but luckily they came and we were able to expose it and call out government officials. I felt really bad because they just sent her in and she, she you know, she's not making decisions, but. Um, I questioned her in front of the media because she was basically saying like we've been here since day one and I was like this is the first time we've ever seen you and it's like six days later like you're not telling the truth um, and so it was really a really frustrating process to go through because it felt like I was like one of the only people advocating for like my family in the community and everyone else was like too scared to talk to the media because a lot of people have been silenced um, you know we a lot of older generation they don't want to talk to the media they don't want to um, they don't want to like cause trouble, right? So it was. It's really hard sometimes because I feel like I'm like, I'm like the troublemaker. Um, 
This is 15 months later where we found, um, they said the company had cleaned it up and this is what we found. This is just like mud, um, not mud, it's like oil, like it smelled so, so gross. And it was, the elders say when, you know, things are alive that you, that had little bugs, they're on like the water and things like that. It was just dead, silent, no bugs. And it was just a dead zone. It was just really black tar all around. And that's that they said they had cleaned up and we could see like wolf footprints around and everything. And this is where people hunt. And they didn't, you know, this is their, this is their clean, clean up. <laughs> so it's one of the counselors that was, um, came and we took samples of the water. And more pipeline spills, I won't go too much into it. Um, but this is another thing that I wanted to talk about, um, to go on from what I was talking about yesterday. Um, for us in, and I know it's the same for our indigenous sisters here in um, south of the medicine line, uh, that it doesn't change the circumstances of murder and missing women indigenous women in the states as well as in Canada but in in the US it's it's epidemic um, right now and it's it's very much been known by our communities for the past 30 years um, but it just like was swept under the carpet repeatedly um, even though there was a lot of advocates in the different communities that were saying like there's a problem like our women are going missing and they're being murdered and no one's doing anything about it and when we go to the police they don't they just close the case you know, they say, oh, she committed suicide or, oh, you know, it was a lot of victim blaming that was happening. And so, yeah, so I mean, I, for the past decade, I've been attending marches. We have huge marches in Vancouver. There's ones in Toronto. There's now ones in Edmonton, Winnipeg, all over major, all major cities. They have um, these memorials on February 14th um, for Valentine's Day for the, the women. And then, yeah, I, I mean, I guess for me, I've never thought that that would happen to my sister. Um, because she was, I don't know, she was just such a bright light and she lived, you know, very, like she was a homebody. Like she, she liked going out and she liked dancing, but she liked being with her family. And what happened was that she went to school, she left uh, Alberta and because we're a really close family, so we're always around each other. We, we knew each other's friends and stuff. But when she moved to Toronto she, to finish her um, education, she went to college, Humber College there. And, she was u utilizing the arts, um, she was in the fashion arts, and so she, we didn't know who her friends were all the time, we didn't know um, these things, so when, the, when our women leave and go into these cities, there's, you know, it's not the safest, safest places, especially when, they're not by, when they don't have their family around. Um, so yeah, that's Bella, and she was 25, and in this July 20th will be the third year. We will have a memorial for her, on, we have back home on the land, um, and so this is, I think one of the things too, when we hear of murder and missing women, we don't think of like how much it actually is impacting like our, cult our culture. Because for me, I feel like my role in my, um, my family and in my community is land protection. And so that's what I've dedicated my life on is to protect and um, challenge corporations and challenge the government. And, um, you know, had to get over a lot of fear um, about 10 years ago that, okay, they could come after me and I'm willing to give my life up for that. And that was something that I had to come to terms with. And Bella, on the other hand, she, for her, her way of carrying knowledge in our, in, in our family um, and carrying on traditions in our family was to practice that culture. You know, we practice it, but hers was, you know, making the hides and making moccasins and following in like my cookum's footsteps because I don't think I could ever be as good as Bella did. Um, and so, and I, never, and I was never gonna try to because that was her role in our family. And my role was to protect the land so then we could practice our culture. And so when things like this happen, I think, um, you know, it's, it's, it's like a, it's a further disruption. It's a further um, wound um, that happens because, you know, um, maybe would, would, should I quit doing what I'm doing and go back home and like, you know, do, do all the, like I do do, go, go do, um, like I, I sometimes I just want to quit and go home and learn my language. That'd be nice. Um, but that's, that's kind of, you know, our different roles and so in our, in our communities. And so I think one of the things that I really want to reiterate is that it's, you know, it's, this is thousands of families. It's not just my family. This is thousands of families that are experiencing this. And I think, the thing with traumatic death, so this is when Bella was younger, Bella there, um, and 
when our families are experiencing this, it's just like a reiteration of trauma because with her death being unsolved and her death being listed as suspicious, I, we can never fully heal from it. It's just, it's never going to be fully resolved. And so that's, that's what I'm struggling with because how do I come to peace with something when there's no justice? Um, no justice, no peace. And that's something that I'm really trying to understand and, um, you know, pray a lot about because I, it's a struggle. Um, yeah, so I think one of the things is the ongoing trauma of colonialism and neocolonialism is that like one thing, one way I really heard that made a lot of sense to me was um, there was, I was at this other campaigning retreat a couple of weeks back and there was this guy that was trying to organize veterans around um, voting out the Harper government. And he was like, it's so hard to organize with them sometimes because they have post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. And I was like, wow, that's like our communities. We have PTSD and that's why sometimes it's, you know, we're still trying to deal, we're trying to protect the land, we're trying to protect our women, and we're doing this still while we're carrying all this trauma. And it's, and it, there's like, it just feels like there's sometimes no time to heal. And that's really frustrating. Um, but I feel like, you know, we have to make time for that. And we have to do um, resiliency. Uh, we have to work towards resiliency. And I feel like I am on that path, but I feel it's really, it's really challenging. Um, and making time for our ceremonies is, is extremely important. And that's why, you know, I'll be back home on, on the land this next couple of weeks to, we, we do ceremony every year for Bella and her, and we have a memorial and we have a round dance and we're out on the land. Um, so that's way, our way of like, one of the ways of healing. And um, another way of healing was, and putting, like what you were talking about yesterday, not putting just our energy towards fighting the negative because the more that we put in energy towards just that, then, you know, we're not kind of, this, we're not creating balance. And so for me, after, you know, going around the world and telling people about how horrible the tar sands were and how the oil spill felt like, and you kind of like talking about trauma all the time and like re-triggering my trauma just so people could understand trauma or understand the issues that we were dealing with. Um, you know, I was like pretty close. It was pretty like some days are like, feel like a lot of despair, you know, and I'm not, I'm not like a general, I'm usually like a generally really happy person. And so I was like, the fact that I'm feeling so like in despair is that's, that's a problem. Um, and I can't continue to do this work if I'm going to constantly be re-triggering myself. So this is what I decided to do instead. And I'll talk a bit more about this tomorrow and talk about the process that we went through. But this is, um, yeah, this is, we, uh, for my master's degree, I decided to um, not just write about solar and renewable technology, but actually put up a solar project back home. So we put up an 80 panel, 20.8 kilowatt system that actually powers our health center. So that's, that's, for me, this is what also resiliency looks like because it's decreasing our dependency on the very thing that is actually killing us. So, um, and we call it pitapan, which means a new dawn, a new era. And um, that's my dad. He's the chief, so he's going to cut the ribbon right there. But yeah, so it was a really exciting day, and I'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. But um, for me, that's a part of what resiliency looks like, and also spending more time on the land, spending more time in ceremony, and spending time to heal um, alongside um, all this work that we do in the outside world. So, hi, hi.